Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. We have a big turnout this morning. Um, before we begin our third and final panel this morning, I'd like to introduce one of our conference sponsors, Mr. Mitch Hart. We'd like to share a few words with you before our, lunch, our panel this morning. Mr. Hart is a native Texan and 1956 graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Following his service in the U.S. Marine Corps, he joined IBM Corporation as a marketing representative. In 1962, Mr. Hart joined Ross Perot as one of the founders of Electronic Data Systems Corporation, and in 1969, he became executive vice president of the company. A year later, he became president and held the position until his retirement in 1977. Later in 1978, Mr. Hart founded and remains chairman of the board of Remax Incorporated. In 1983, he formed Hart Group Incorporated, a diversified group of companies involved in installation, manufacturing, and investments. Furthermore, Mr. Hart is a member of World Presence Organization and Chief Executive Organization Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, our generous sponsor, Mr. Mitch Hart. Thank you very much. Seeing all you here is a dream come true for my wife and I, and I think also for Admiral Rimstall. We joined them in, what, 2000, in, in 2000, in terms of sponsoring this lecture. Uh, I feel extremely blessed. The Naval Academy did a lot for me. It, it taught me to, to value leadership and to try your best to do it. Uh, that helped the Marine Corps help even more. One of, one of the things that happened in my life that really occasioned this was that during the Vietnam War, I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps in 1961, just prior to the Vietnam War. Many of my classmates, some of which are here tonight, or today, stayed in the service, and the Marines were there in Vietnam somewhere between two and three times, the ones that lived. After that, during the Vietnam War, I ended up in a situation in which I went from college campus to college campus talking to students because, in my opinion, we lost a generation in Vietnam because of the very dissimilarities between civilian and military life and the fact the military was pretty roundly disregarded and frankly hated during that period of time. You know, with people going to Canada and some people refusing to serve and then other people coming back and being treated terribly is not a good time. So I ended up speaking on college campuses and the deal I had with the college students was this. I'll listen to you, you listen to me. And I was one of these, my country right around my country. And I'm not sure they learned anything. I learned a lot during that period of time. But I swore then that if I had anything to do with it, I wanted to see that the military and civilian people, as they grew up and as they went through college, would have a chance to interface with each other. So Admiral Renskopf and his class started this. And at that point in time, particularly military schools that were here. And part of our deal was that, you know, if you'll add the civilian schools to it, and I'm proud to say there are, what, 30, 32 schools here tonight, and over 200 people. Thank you all for coming. You're making my time too. I want to recognize our class. Tell me in 1956 or two we have here. I know I saw a couple out there. Right? We've got a great panel here. Charlie Wilson was a classmate, was one of my closest friends in his today. Thank you very much. Now I'll turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Donnie Horner. Hi, everybody. My name is Donnie Horner. I'm a professor of, of leadership in the Department of Leadership, Ethics, and Law here at the Academy. I hold the Class of 61 Chair in Leadership, Ethics, and Law, and I'm just delighted to be here with you. We've got a, a, a real group of superstars here, and in keeping with the theme of the panels before us, what we'll do is, I'll ask, after introducing the panelists, I'll ask each of them to to, to say a few words on a selected topic. And the topic for this panel is, what is your generational perspective on leadership? After we've done that, what we'd like to do is use as much time as possible to have, have uh, a chance to entertain your questions. With that, uh, if you go to page 23 in your program, 
and bear with me, I'd like to read to you the bios on each of our panelists. To my far right is the Honorable Charlie Wilson. Congressman Charlie Wilson started his career in politics at the young age of 13 by defeating his neighbor in a local city council election. After graduating from the Naval Academy in 56, he served four years in the Navy before being sworn in as a Texas state representative. During the next 12 years as a state representative, he battled for the rights of the poor before being elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from the 2nd District of Texas in 1972. He served in Congress for 23 years. During this time, he was most known for his support of the Afghan Mujahideen against the Red Army. In 2007, the movie Charlie Wilson's War portrayed his funding of the anti-Soviet Afghan campaign. To my immediate right is Dr. Eric Greitens. There is no truth to the rumor that because Eric is a SEAL that he will have the mission of ripping the microphone from <laughs> Congressman Wilson. <laughs> As I said, Dr. Greitens is a Navy SEAL officer and currently serves with a reserve unit at Special Operations Command. His personal military awards include the Combat Action Ribbon, the Purple Heart, and the Bronze Star. In 2005-2006, Eric was appointed by the President to serve as a White House Fellow. It's considered America's most prestigious fellowship for leadership and public service. Eric currently serves as Volunteer Chairman and CEO of The Mission Continues, which empowers wounded and disabled veterans to continue lives of public service here at home. He founded it with his combat pay from Iraq. In October 2008, the President personally awarded Eric the President's Volunteer Service Award in recognition of his inspiring and national leadership on his work with wounded and disabled veterans. He teaches on public service, ethics, and leadership as a fellow, as a senior fellow at the University of Missouri and at Washington University in St. Louis. To my immediate left is Ms. Laura McKechnie. Laura has served as the Columbia Desk Officer for the U.S. Agency for International Development for a year and a half, where she's been the D.C. liaison for U.S. assistance in the areas of alternative development, democracy, and internally displaced persons in Columbia, South America. Previously, Laura spent two years working for the Department of State in the Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau, which she served as a policy analyst and delegate for meetings with the United Nations and the European Union. Previous to her time in government, Ms. McKechnie worked for a nonprofit that provided affordable housing for low-income elderly in Washington, D.C. She has also served as a volunteer for a microcredit bank in Peru and as an international volunteer in Honduras. Laura has joint master's degrees in public administration and international relations from Syracuse and a baccalaureate degree in journalism from the University of Maryland. Finally, to my far left is Captain Tim Strabing, United States Marine Corps. Tim graduated from the Naval Academy and was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps in May 2001. He went on to earn his master's degree from Oxford in Russian and European studies. He later served for 12 months as a line platoon commander deploying to El Anbar, Iraq, for seven months in taking part in Operation Alpha Car, the assault on Fallujah in November 2004. Reassigned as the company XO for India Company, three, India Company 3-1 in April 2005, Tim again deployed to El Anbar and completed the deployment as a Battalion Assistant Operations Officer. In July 06, he reported back to the Naval Academy as an instructor in the Political Science Department where he currently teaches U.S. irregular warfare and global strategic studies. So here's the question for our panelists, and we'll start with, with uh, Congressman Wilson. There are many possible motivations for serving as a leader. Possible motivated, motives include patriotism, altruism, a sense of moral obligation, civic duty, or even greed or selfishness. Given this backdrop, What's your sense of why leaders of your generation lead? Or put differently, why do leaders of your generation serve? Congressman Wilson. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
It's always a thrill to revisit the Naval Academy. Uh, I uh, was a pretty sorry midshipman, but uh, I did a little better in the Navy. It's a good thing, because otherwise I would have been immediately court-martialed. Uh, I was in the class of 1956. John McCain was 1958. When we were both on the Board of Visitors, we argued about who had the most demerits. I'm pretty sure I was ahead, but John makes a ferocious argument, and so I let him claim the credit. Be that as it may, all of the old grads are immensely proud that we came to Annapolis. We're more than proud of the quality of men and women who are going to graduate this year and in years to come. In the early 70s, mid-70s really, a very controversial issue was whether or not women should be allowed to attend the Naval Academy. I'm happy to say that I voted right on that issue and voted for all of the women. By the way, all of my mail from my classmates was not entirely laudatory. But it was the right thing to do, and it was certainly from the officers I've talked to this time and last year, it was certainly the right thing to do for the Navy. I'm often asked how I got into politics. When I was 13, I had a dog named Teddy, who was 14. I watched Teddy die an agonizing and hideous death in the little town's drugstore where I grew up. The druggist, who was the nearest thing we had to a vet, proclaimed that my dog had died because he had been poisoned with ground glass. I was absolutely inconsolable. Later that day, I found that my neighbor, whose name was Charles Hazard, was bragging about having poisoned my dog. I did the only thing I could at age 13. He claimed that he poisoned a dog because the dog had soiled his lawn. So that night, I slipped out of the house, got a couple of cans of kerosene, and did the only thing I knew to do. I went over and, of course, burned his lawn down. <laughs> but, uh, but when I was 14, that was not nearly enough. When I was 14, my parents dutifully lied for me, and I got a hardship driver's license. I drove across town, three, there was three miles between where the whites lived and where the African Americans lived. And I went over and told the ministers in the African American community that I was very interested in politics and wanted to give everybody a ride to the polls that June. On election day, I drove back and forth all day. But before I let anybody out of the, out of the car, I took 96 people to the polls. And before I let anyone out of the car, I told them that I would like for them to know I didn't want to try to influence their vote, but I wanted them to know that Charles Hazard poisoned my dog. <laughs> <laughs> I drove 96 people to the polls that day and beat that old son of a bitch by 16 votes. <laughs> That was the day I fell in love with America. <laughs> in keeping with the leadership theme, and you will have to draw your own conclusions, but in keeping with the leadership theme, I'm going to tell you a very brief story of Charlie Wilson's war. It concerns the Soviet defeat in the first modern war of Afghanistan. As some of you know, and this has been mentioned, it was a New York Times bestseller when written as a book, and when Staged as a movie, it starred Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts. It was patriotism that I largely acquired here, and I saw it as my moral obligation as an American congressman. It was an opportunity to do serious damage to the Red Army and to the Soviet Union. The leadership challenge, of course, was in Congress. And it took determination rather than brains. The merits had to be sold. It was pretty easy among conservatives because they're hostile to the Soviet Union to start with. Liberals were a little more difficult because of their basic anti-war instincts. I had to convince them, the liberals, I had to convince them that it would appeal to their constituents 
to see him take a tough stand against tyranny. This worked out very well, but it took a lot of work. Finally, I had to persuade at least the House members on the necessity of keeping a secret, which was very difficult, on, on the necessity of keeping a secret and the absolute imperative of nonpartisanship. This was an all-day job and sometimes all night. As far as I know, it had never been done before, and you can be sure it'll never be done again. I had to be absolutely consistent and focused for 10 years. That in itself was a tough job, especially for me. When I got back from Afghanistan, I was able to raise the CIA appropriation to $20 million from $5 million, and then $80 million, and eventually we got to $3 billion a year. In 1984, and I remember this well, we got a $300 million contribution from the United States Navy, which was not entirely appreciated by everybody. During all this time, only about 25 members of Congress knew exactly what was happening. By 1985, the valiant warriors of the Hindu Kush were easily winning the ground war but we were taking horrible casualties from the MI-24 MI Hind helicopter gunships. We were begging for Stinger missiles, but were opposed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the State Department, and the National Security Council. Fortunately, there was one man in Washington who didn't oppose us. His name was Ronald Reagan. He sent me word in 1985 that he was approving the Stinger missiles. In September of 86, the Muj fired, Mujahideen fired four Stingers and shot down three of the gunships. Soviet casualties went through the roof, and the war was officially over, although it took two more years to convince the Soviets that they had lost. The barefoot men of the Hindu Kush had broken the teeth of the evil empire, and the ferocious Red Army, its tail between its legs, ignominiously marched home. We never claimed that we broke the back of the Red Army. They were simply too big, but we broke their hearts. This powerful voice in the Politburo was muted to a whisper. There was no military option for the Soviets when the Berlin Wall came down 11 months later. No bayonets were drawn when the Poles, emboldened by their Pope, claimed the streets of Warsaw. The Romanians disposed of the worst tyranny Europe had seen since Hitler, and the Czechs celebrated their Velvet Revolution. Within Russia itself, the gulags were thrown open. A million Jews immigrated to Israel, and the Russian Orthodox Church to this day welcomes worshipers. The world rests infinitely easier. The changes are of biblical proportions. This epic struggle was astonishing. But the most startling of all is that the evil empire collapsed without the spilled blood of a single American soldier, sailor, or Marine. And it was all because we were able to persuade my fellow congressmen not to invoke partisanship and not to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Congressman Wilson. Uh, Dr. Greitens. Sure. Can everybody uh, pull this a little closer? Everybody hear me? Yeah. Good. So I'm, I'm at a very interesting place in my uh, public service now. I'm, I'm now a, a reserve officer and uh, serving at Special Operations Command. But I've come home and I live now in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I grew up. And uh, I was reminded recently by my parents of my first real experience in, in leadership uh, when I came home. They said to me, they said, Eric, do you remember the first time that we left you alone to babysit your two younger brothers? I said, yes, yes, I remember this. I said, and do you remember how when we came home the police were on the phone? <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I, I remember this. And they said, and do you remember how your younger brother had called 911 because you punched him? 
I said, yes, yes, I, I remember this. So it, it's, it's fun for me being home uh, now and, uh, and running a project called uh, The Mission Continues, where we give fellowships to wounded and disabled veterans so that they can start to serve again here at home. Uh, you have all probably been told many times, uh, if not during this conference, then certainly during your uh, time in college, that you are the leaders of the future and that you represent the next generation of American leadership. And what I want to tell you is that that's not true. You do not represent the next generation of American leadership. Um, I have worked on the streets of Fallujah with 18 and 19 year old Marines and 20 year old SEALs. Um, when I worked in Rwanda just after the genocide and I was working in refugee camps in Goma, Zaire, I worked there with 17 and 18 year old community leaders. Um, when I worked with street children in Bolivia, I worked with 15 and 16 year old uh, street children who had, had themselves uh, become leaders in their community. Um, when I worked in the, uh, in the former Yugoslavia with Bosnian refugees who had survived the ethnic cleansing and were now living in refugee camps and trying to recreate hope in their communities, many of those leaders were 20, 21 years old. So what I want to emphasize today is that uh, you are not the future leaders of the United States. You are leaders today. And that if we're doing our job right, and you're doing your job right, we are thinking about what you have to contribute to our country today. Um, I'll just say a few words about how I think uh, great leaders go about their work. Great leaders, I think, do one thing above all else. And this is true whether you're in a refugee camp. It's true whether you're standing by the bedside of a wounded warrior. It's true whether you're on the streets of Fallujah. Uh, above all else, great leaders help people to live meaningful lives. They help people to live meaningful lives through service. Now, how do we, how do we actually make that happen? Uh, when I came back from Iraq, I'd been serving very closely with, uh, with the Marines there. I had an experience myself where uh, uh, our barracks was hit by a suicide truck bomb. Uh, I was very fortunate to... Uh, to leave with, with just the most minor wounds, uh, but men who were standing as, as close to me as Congressman Wilson were, were hit much harder that day. So when I came back, I went to Bethesda and I visited with some of our recently returned uh, wounded, wounded Marines. And I asked each one of them what they wanted to do when they recovered. And as many of you have probably had the, the experience, if you've ever had the opportunity to visit with some of our, uh, our wounded warriors, Every one of them told me that they wanted to return to their unit. Now, that was inspiring, that was motivational, but uh, the fact also was that uh, those men and women were injured pretty severely and they were not going to be returning to their unit anytime soon. Uh, one of them had lost both of his legs, another one had lost his, uh, his right arm and most of his lung capacity and his right lung, another had lost all of his hearing. And so what I said to each one of them was, I said, well, if you can't uh, return to your unit right away, tell me what else you'd like to do. And I was struck that every single one of them told me that they wanted to continue to serve somehow. And they didn't necessarily use the word public service. One of them said, you know what, I came from a rough childhood growing up and I'd like to go home and be a mentor and a coach. Another one said that he'd like to be a teacher. Another one wanted to be a police officer. Another one said, you know, I had a really rough time when I came into the hospital and I lost my legs, but I'd like to stay here to help other Marines know that there's hope for them at the end of their recovery. Uh, now what struck, us, what struck me that day was that while all of these men and women felt incredibly grateful that they had so many people coming to them to say thank you to them for their service and their sacrifice, what they needed to hear, in addition to thank you, was we still need you. What they needed to know was that we looked at them as an asset. What they needed to know was that we were glad that they were home and that we wanted them to continue to serve. So what we do with the mission continues is a very simple thing. Uh, when a wounded or disabled vet walks into my office, I just ask them one question. And the question is, how do you want to continue to serve your community or your country? And then we challenge them 
to meet, uh, we help them to meet that challenge of continuing to serve. Uh, some of them now work as physical therapists with children uh, who have physical disabilities. Some of them work as post-traumatic stress disorder counselors. Uh, others work with big brothers, big sisters. But what I want to emphasize to you as, uh, as leaders today is that if you really want to help somebody create a meaningful life, create a meaningful opportunity and service, one of the things that you have to do is you have to challenge them. Because when you challenge someone, what you're letting them know is that you believe in them. When you challenge them, you're letting them know that you believe that they have the capacity to meet that challenge. I'll make a couple of other points very, uh, very quickly. One of the other things that, that's really important to help people create a meaningful life in service is to help them understand the story of their own service. Uh, when I was a SEAL commander, I'd often share with uh, my guys stories from the book Gates of Fire, stories about the Spartans at, um, at the Battle of Thermopylae. And I'll tell you just one, one very quick story. Um, at the end of the Battle of Thermopylae, as many of you know, the Spartans have lost. And what happens is that the Persian king cuts off the head of the Spartan king and impales it on a spear. At a later battle at Plataea, the Spartans have defeated the Persians. And the Spartans then come to their leader, Pausanias, and they urge him to cut off the head of the Persian king and impale it on a spear. What Pausanias says is no. He says such actions are more fit for barbarians than for Greeks, and even in them we find it a matter of offense. He said, let it please the people that we conduct ourselves with decent actions and decent words. Now, I had and have no idea what specific challenges my people are going to face on the battlefield. But what I do know is that I want them to hold to a standard of honor and integrity, no matter what the challenges are that they face on the battlefield, and no matter what the behavior of the enemy. If you're going to help somebody create a meaningful life through service, you really have to help them as a leader. You have to help them understand the tradition of service in which they come from the tradition that they're meant to uphold, so that when my men are on that field, they know that they have to uphold the tradition of honor. As we tell them, and I tell them, that when you're on that battlefield, you do not represent the United States of America. There is no sense in which you are a representative for something else. When you are on that battlefield, you are America in action. And this is true uh, whether you are uh, a Marine on the streets of Fallujah, whether you're working with the USAID mission, whether you're working with a nonprofit, you are actually serving as America in action. And we have to help as leaders, we have to help our people understand the story uh, and the tradition uh, from, which, from which they come. Finally, the last point is that uh, this is, you know, we talk about uh, different generational perspectives on leadership. One thing that is always enduring is character. And uh, this is true whether you're, um, uh, you know, whether you're, you're 80 years old or, or 20 years old, great leaders exemplify great character. Um, and they help others to match their passions to the world's needs. Uh, the Greeks used to say that, uh, that your character is your destiny. I, I found that that is, is absolutely true, that your character is your, your destiny. And the way that we build our character is through building worthy habits. And so what I would challenge all of you today is to think of yourselves um, not as future leaders, but to think of yourselves as leaders today, leaders of the moment, leaders that our country can turn to in, in no matter what field you're going to be working, people who've real, built the right set of uh, habits, the right set of virtues, and the right kind of character uh, that we need to look to uh, to, secu to secure um, the future, to give hope um, to, uh, to people who need it. And I, I know that all of you are up for the challenge. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be interested to know that uh, Dr. Greiton will be autographing his book, Strength and Compassion. It will be available this afternoon in the Midshipman Store from 1, one o'clock to 3 o'clock. Again, that's the Midshipman Store from 1 to 3. Uh, Ms. Laura McKechnie. Thank you. Can you hear me now? 
Okay, that's better. Thank you. Whether you serve as a naval officer or as a desk officer for USAID, you're representing your organization and your country. Today, however, I'm not speaking for my agency, and my, re my remarks are not official in nature, but my own view of the world. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to serve in this distinguished panel. It feels good to be home in Annapolis and home at the Naval Academy. I say at home in Annapolis because I grew up in a suburb here. I say at home at the Naval Academy because although my parents were not involved in the military, we served as a sponsor family and graduated eight mids when I was in college and high school. Why do leaders of our generation serve? How many of you last week were able to see the inauguration in person? Okay, anyone see it on YouTube? Daily Show? <laughs> Very good. This is a generational thing. I was on the uh, mall and listening to President Obama's speech, I was struck by one particular phrase that embodies exactly what I've been thinking about in preparing for this panel. In thanking our servicemen and women who are serving abroad, President Obama said, we honor them not only because they are the guardians of our liberty, but because they find meaning in something greater than themselves. And yet at this moment, a moment that will define a generation, it is this, precisely this spirit that must inhabit us all. Why do leaders of our generation serve? Well, let me walk you through some examples from my life to highlight the reasons why I think leaders serve. First, people lead because they feel it is the right thing to do. In my own life, I don't remember having a moral obligation as a young child to be a leader, but I do remember having a moral obligation to do things that were, not do things that were bad, such as lie, cheat, and steal, and to do things that were good, such as to be honest and help others in need. These values then became the basis for the decisions in my life that I made to become a leader, such as foregoing big bucks to work in a nonprofit serving low-income elderly, or using my own vacation time to serve as an international volunteer in Peru and Honduras. Second, as idealistic as it sounds, people serve, as Eric said, to help other people. This is one of the main reasons why I switched jobs two years ago to work for the U.S. Agency for International Development. USAID provides assistance to people in developing countries around the world, from Afghanistan to Haiti. I work on Latin America, and in my region, we help Afro-Colombians living in sticks that have been displaced by violence, indigenous women trying to sell their wares in Bolivia. And in my position in Washington, far away from these people, answering emails and phone calls, I still think of them every day. I think of the opportunities they will have for a better, more prosperous life. Leadership through helping others can come in, in uh, ways closer to home as well, such as helping a, a classmate with an assignment or assisting a colleague manipulate a, an Excel spreadsheet. Third, people lead, I really think so, because they are empowered to do so through opportunities, people, and sometimes even events. When I was a senior in undergrad, as many of you are today, I was accepted into a National Leadership Honor Society, Omicron Delta Kappa. I'm still not sure today why I got into that leadership society. Uh, ODK was founded to recognize leadership of exceptional quality and versatility. But in high school and in college, I never thought of myself as a real leader. I wasn't the president of a student government association, and I wasn't the captain of any sports team. But I was a leader in my own sense, because I was the editor of a newsletter, a team leader in the classroom, and a key member of an honors program. Part of leadership, I really think, is taking the opportunity to lead when it is provided. Empowerment should and, and, and can come from more than group membership or even conferences like today. It can also come from role models and mentors. Did you all know that President Obama's speechwriter is 27 years old? That's inspiration in itself. <clears throat> and as for me, I've been lucky enough to find wonderful mentors that I can turn to in my life when I make a decision. I'm lucky enough to have two of those people here today. And finally, I don't think every motivation for leadership has to be about someone else, serving someone else. It can be for selfish reasons as well. Leaders serve because, really, they can be involved in some pretty cool things. When I finished graduate school, I was awarded a Presidential Management Fellowship, which is a two-year uh, rotational training opportunity for the federal government. Through this fellowship, I received extra training and rotational opportunities apart from my normal job. And I got to do some pretty interesting things, to tell you the truth. 
While working at the State Department, I served on U.S. delegations to the United Nations and helped negotiate drug and crime, international drug and crime resolutions. I loved to travel and I was paid to live in Bolivia for two months. On one rotation, I worked at USAID where I realized it was a better fit for me from the Department of State and met valuable contacts that alerted me to, job, to future job openings. And in my current position at USAID as the Columbia Desk Officer, I serve as the main representative in DC for the hundreds of staff and contractors we have working in Columbia, South America. In this job, I've gotten to fly on Columbian Air Force One, brief influential Hill staffers, and meet indigenous leaders who risk their lives to defend human rights. All of these experiences came with a lot of hard work, some really bad jet lag, and one near-death experience, which I know for all of you military folks isn't a big deal, but for a policy officer in Washington, this is not in my normal line of duty. <laughs> in closing, leaders of our, my generation serve for a variety of reasons, even if it isn't for the ones I've just stated. In order to empower these new leaders, I think two things need to happen. First, we as young leaders need to support each other, not just the ones that look and think like we do. We as older leaders need to learn from and mentor the young generation and not discount someone because of their age, gender, or race. We as a society have to empower leaders and become leaders because as President Obama said last week, at this moment, it is precisely this spirit that must inhabit us all. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Captain Strabin. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm not sure how a Marine Infantry Officer ended up on this distinguished panel, but uh, I'm thankful nonetheless. Uh, just a few things from, from my perspective that I would put forward to this question. Why do leaders of your generation serve? And, and some of it's from my perspective as sort of the active duty Marine on the panel, uh, and some of it's just my own personal perspective, thinking about sort of our generation and, and why uh, we do serve. Uh, Three things I put forward to you. Uh, the first one, response to world events. Uh, the second one is finding meaning in the midst of, of affluence. And the third one is the role of religious convictions. Let me unpack uh, each one of those here for just a couple minutes. Um, this idea of response to world events, uh, I don't think you can understate the role that 9-11 has played in, in this generation. And especially for those who, who have served in uniform, uh, I came to the Naval Academy in, in 97 uh, and graduated in 2001 and, and really feel like uh, I missed, um, in terms of being here at the Naval Academy, so, some interesting times compared to where we are today as a, as a nation at war. And I think this idea of uh, service in a post 9-11 world has taken on new significance for my generation in a lot of ways. I think back to my time as uh, an infantry officer out in the fleet and every single one of my corporals and below enlisted after 9-11. They enlisted in the Marine Corps at a time where they knew they were going to go to war. Uh, and I had so much respect for e each one of those uh, individual enlisted Marines who stepped up uh, to the plate to serve their country and to go into harm's way um, following 9-11. So I think that had a, had a big influence. The other side of this that I'd like to talk about is, is the Naval Academy here. And, and some of the midshipmen are, are well aware of this, but for all of you uh, non-Naval Academy uh, attendees of the conference, I just want to share a little bit about what's going on here at the, at the Naval Academy. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the midshipmen uh, and all sort of cadets and midshipmen that are here today uh, stepping up to serve in, in a pretty tough geostrategic environment. Uh, in particular, I think about my own profession as a Marine, and the Marine Corps is heavily dependent on contributions from the Naval Academy each year. Uh, and one would think in, in sort of what's been happening in Iraq and Afghanistan that it might not be the easiest to recruit Marines here from the Naval Academy, but the exact opposite is happening. I think this is indicative of what's going on in terms of, of service and leadership within this generation. Uh, if we take the, the current class of seniors, the first class midshipmen, uh, there were 330 first class midshipmen who had the Marine Corps as their first choice of what they wanted to do when they graduated from here. That's an unprecedented historical record for the number of a class that, that wanted to go Marine Corps. And we're going to commission 270 into the Marine Corps. Again, a historical record by over 40. And I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of blown away by that uh, in, in, in regards to this call to duty and this call to service that um, 
young people want to step up and do the most difficult thing they possibly can, at least in my mind, and, and that's to, to go into the Marine Corps and serve. Uh, and I think that's just really impressive and indicative of how 9-11 and how a desire to serve really permeates members of the military. Um, and, and maybe I would just sort of put out a question uh, in, in that regard, and maybe we can get to it in the question and answer part, but what does this mean in terms of civil mil military relations in this country? I think that's a pretty important uh, thing we're working on here at the conference, and I'm, I'm so glad to see the, the variety of faces and 32 institutions represented here. But that's a real question that's in my mind. How, how do we bridge the civil military gap where such a small percentage of our country serves in uniform, but there's so many opportunities within service, and how can we tap into that in this current generation? So maybe we can talk a little bit more about that in the question and answer. Um, the next piece I want to talk about is this idea of finding meaning in affluence. And whether you realize it or not, we live in the most affluent culture in the world. And, and as you have the opportunity to travel and, and sort of experience different places in, in different countries, um, just one statistic to sort of illustrate that. So within the United States, we have 40% of the world's wealth. Uh, but the U.S. population is only 5% of, of the world's total population. And, and maybe we don't feel like right now we're the most affluent with everything going on with the economy and that kind of thing. But uh, if you take a step back, we're an incredibly blessed country and, and we live uh, at a standard that's really unprecedented in history. So I think that uh, one of the challenges for leaders in our generation is we've seen how possessions and money can really drive uh, individuals in ways that aren't necessarily great for families and communities. That there's a sense that uh, just making money results in emptiness. And I think there's a realization about that. And I think the question is beginning to shift uh, in some ways that it's not necessarily how much money can one make, but rather how big of a difference can you make in the lives of others. And I think we're seeing that take place in the sense that Affluence and possessions aren't providing meaning, but really where meaning is provided in service of others and making a difference in their lives. And I think there's a realization uh, taking place with, within our generation in, in that regard. Um, the last point I want to make is, is the role of, of religious convictions, or simply put, faith. Um, I, I would be remiss if we sort of left this off the, the table. I think it's an important one. Uh, that's not to say that if, if you don't have religious convictions, it doesn't mean you can't do fantastic things in the world of service, because certainly uh, ever, everyone contributes in, in that regard. But I think that for this generation, uh, faith is an important aspect of, of why people serve. Um, if you look at a couple statistics, the, the Barna Group says that um, for 55% of, of young people, uh, religious convictions are very important to them. Uh, moreover, if you listen to what Pew Research has to say, of 18 to 29 year olds, 74 percent uh, identify with a specific religion. And so I, I would put forward that s religious faith is oftentimes a motivator and something that, that really helps people uh, think about something bigger than themselves and to serve something uh, above themselves. I, I think of sort of the example of the Ten Commandments that are central to Christianity and Judaism. And if you boil down the Ten Commandments, it's about loving God and loving your neighbor. And loving your neighbor is an important aspect of service. That it's no longer uh, simply selfishly looking at what you want to do, but this idea of stewardship comes in, that you're a caretaker and, and you have a responsibility to not only the people, but the world around you. And so I think religious conviction plays a pretty important role for, for our generation when, when we think about service. So I think I'll just wrap it up there and, and we'll move to the questions. Uh, I'll be at this point. Wow. I told you we had superstars. Now let's see if our audience questions matches that, that uh, level of input. Uh, yes, sir. Hello, my name is Ryan Peterson from Kirsten University. Uh, I'd like to say something first that doesn't get set off around here, and that's go Army. <laughs> <laughs> uh, based on various aspects of each of your backgrounds, I was wondering what perspectives any of you might have on Greg Mortensen at the Central Asia Institute and what impact this work will have in combating on education and terrorism for future generations? Laura, did you want to? <laughs> Ping the development question to the development person. Um, I, I don't know what, if anybody has read the book, it's called Three Cups of Tea. If you haven't, um, I would highly recommend it. Um, you know, I, you know, to be perfectly honest, um, 
coming from the government in a highly bureau bureaucratic institution, I was really struck by that book. Um, what this gentleman did, he was a climber, and, and he tried to summit K2 and was unable to. He ended up taking refuge in a local um, village, and they helped him get back together, and he decided he was going to come back and build a school. Um, I think someone like that, you know, he basically then spent his entire life, he got really lucky and found a foundation that supported him. Um, but he spent his whole life, he came back to the States, lived in a, um, a, his car, I think, um, saved up all of his money and came back to, to try and build a school. Um, you know, it's, like I said, conviction like that is really inspiring, coming from an agency where to spend one cent, we have to go through a pile of paperwork about this big, so we make sure we're, you know, hitting all of the, uh, we're not spending taxpayer money, you know, unscrupulously. Um, but I think something like that, really, it takes someone, this man sacrificed his entire life. He spent most of his time, um, even after he was married in Pakistan, and, um, you know, I would like to see more people like that, but again, I realize that people have their own, um, lives. I think people can do things that Greg did in their own types of ways, as Eric had said and as Tim had said as well, um, that we can serve closer to home. We don't necessarily all have to go um, to the far reaches of the earth. Eric? I'll, I'll throw in just a couple quick reflections on that. First is I think that that kind of work is extraordinarily important. It is extraordinarily important for uh, the rest of the world to see uh, Americans doing great work overseas. Some of our very best ambassadors in the world are Peace Corps volunteers um, who are working and living in communities overseas. Uh, you found that in Indonesia after the tsunami when the United States Navy and other institutions started providing aid, positive perceptions of the United States tripled and support for bin Laden fell to its lowest level since 9-11. Like there are very real implications to doing that kind of very proactive, positive work outside. So uh, now what does that mean? So that, that's kind of a, a strategic reflection. What does that mean for you who are here? First, I think that if you're in, um, if you're in ROTC or you're in uh, the Naval Academy, I think one thing that I would urge you to do as much as possible is to use every opportunity that you have, especially during the summers, uh, to get out work uh, with the State Department, work with USAID, work with the nonprofit organization, work with the think tank, uh, work overseas and find a way to get some of that experience. It's, it's, it's incredibly important uh, for everyone to get that kind of, kind of experience to be um, effective in a, in a global world. And then finally, and this just uh, kind of reiterates I think what, what Laura said, like if you see a need out there and you're passionate about it, do it. Another question. Uh, good morning. My name is Stephanie Shea from the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, I have a two-part question. Um, the first one is for Congressman Wilson. Um, my question to you, sir, is um, what is the one regret that you had while serving as a congressman? And my second question is to all the panelists. What are the core values that guide you through difficult times? Okay. Well, I was in Congress nearly 24 years, and I enjoyed almost all of it. But uh, as is the case in many things, uh, and that was the things you felt the most passionate about, with the exception of the Afghan war in my case, but with those things that you felt the most passionate about, often it just took forever to get them done. And uh, for, for people that are, and of course all of us, if we, if we are serious, we're impatient. And uh, that's a big frustration. And it certainly is with the U.S. Congress. What, how about your core values, uh, Congressman? Would you start us off on that? What core values, the second part of her question was, what, it, what core values emboldened you to action? Well, the core values that emboldened me to action were my extreme feelings about the Soviet Union and the damage it did to the human spirit. And I think, I like to think that uh, somehow or another, I kind of got even with them. <laughs> Eric? Yeah, I'll just say uh, very quickly, I mean, th there are many core values. One of the things I learned when I was uh, 20, I went to work in the refugee camps uh, in, in uh, Goma Zaire uh, with refugees who left from the genocide in Rwanda. 
One of the things that I was incredibly struck by working in those refugee camps was how many people, and keep in mind these were all survivors of the genocide, people who'd walked miles in a refugee movement, had lived through months of disease and deprivation. How many people in those camps were actively involved in service to others? And one of the things that was so striking in the camp was that you think, wow, you know, after all of this destitution, deprivation, you'd think that people would be focused on themselves, but in fact they were involved in service to others. And what I learned there was that actually it's through service that people end up uh, finding and developing their strengths. No matter how difficult, no matter how hard the situation is, they find and develop those strengths through service. It's one of the things that I've carried with me uh, through incredibly difficult times. I find that when I'm really doing my job well, and I'm leading in the right way, and I'm thinking about the people around me, it becomes much easier because I'm not concerned about my own, um, my own pain, my own difficulty. And so uh, one of the values that I think we all need to, uh, to build as leaders is that ability to really think about and put our focus on uh, leading the people around us through service, and we become stronger through that. Laura? Well, I, I talked a lot about this in my, um, in my presentation before, but I think just to add on um, is listening and learning from others. Um, again, you know, I'm in development, and so in our case, um, we spent a lot of years in development going in and telling a community, okay, you're going to build this well, you're going to build this uh, irrigation system, and when the money dried up, we found that the people were not uh, continuing the projects. Why? Because we didn't listen to them. When they were saying, we really want um, you know, schools for our children, we really want food on our tables, and we were just putting in an irrigation well because some engineer from the World Bank came in and said that's what we're supposed to do. So I think really listening um, to people, and not just listening, but in helping to empower them to do um, to facilitate their ideas into action. That's, that's one of my core values, thanks. Tim? Yeah, if I just add to what the panel said, two words, selflessness and humility. And if you can't, as a leader, be a servant, you're not going to be effective. And so uh, we have this sort of term in, in the Marine Corps, you sort of talked about it, adversity. Uh, when things get tough, sometimes people go internal. Uh, and you as a leader have to certainly avoid going internal of sorts and focusing on your own needs and, and satisfying your own desires. And you have to be selfless. You have to put the needs of others uh, before your own. And you know the vignette from the Marine Corps that I often share uh, with, with midshipmen here at the Naval Academy is that uh, marine officers, the more senior the officer are, the, the later in line you're going to be to get food. And officers eat last, senior enlisted eat last, and that's the type of perspective in terms of leadership that you have. You put the needs of, of the people that you're serving before your own in a way that's selfless and with humility. Question in the rear. Hello, my name is Hannah Abushanaub. I'm from Hollins University. And um, my question is for Dr. Freitens. Yes. I spelled it correct. Um, since you work in so many different parts of the world, how do you feel that the cultural, traditional, and uh, religious differences um, help you when you say um, you are trying to help people understand the traditions of service? Do you feel that there are differences depending on where you are working in the world? Uh, w the, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, there, there, are, there are differences. And, and just to emphasize, I think, the point that, uh, that, that Laura made, you know, one of the most in incredibly important things you have to do as a leader is to, is to listen. Um, I remember when I went to Bolivia to, uh, to work with street children, um, I went into one of the homes and I found that they were, uh, they were teaching the arts. They are teaching sculpture and painting and music and a little bit of drama and pottery and I thought, well this certainly has to be wrong. I mean I thought, you know, certainly the first thing these kids need is, is a little bit of uh, basic reading and, and writing. Um, but they explained to me that actually for those kids the most important thing for them was to learn that there was beauty in the world and that they could help to create beauty in the world. And that once those children saw that, then they wanted to learn to read, they wanted to learn to write, and they wanted to pursue um, higher education. But uh, coming in from the outside, I would have never, I would have never thought of it that way. I, n I never would have, have seen that. So, um, you know, my, w the lesson that I've learned is how incredibly important it is uh, when you do um, enter a different culture is, is to listen and to learn. Uh, what I have found is that there are very deep um, similarities in, uh, in values, 
um, across uh, many of these cultures, but in order for us to be really effective there, we have to begin with, with listening and, and learning. Yes, right here. Hi, I'm Jimmy, first class, Jimmy Steve. Uh, I was wondering what the panel had to say about when the youngest generation is usually known as having the most passion, the most fire, the most drive. And in other cultures, other countries where we see a, a higher population of younger youth in, in just the country in general, as in Iran, we see a volatility in their climate. And you're talking about inspiring this younger generation of leaders and get them out there and get them asking questions, get them involved. How do we, uh, how does the older, you know, baby, baby boomer generation X, how do they focus all that compassion, all, all that passion, all that fire into productive ways so that we uh, don't alienate the youngest generation? Anybody want to take it on? <laughs> Tim? <laughs> Give so it to I'll, the Marine. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab at this. I, I think, uh, and it was mentioned a couple times on, on the panel, please sit down. Um, I, I think it was mentioned a couple times on the panel that this idea of, of mentorship is, is absolutely key. And that starts now, just as Eric was saying, that you don't wait to, to be a mentor. Uh, you exercise that in your daily life and in what you do now. And I think that's really the key. If we're going to have uh, direction and, and sort of guide the sort of energy and enthusiasm of, of younger generations, we need examples who are before us who will set that example for us, but also take time to invest uh, in the lives and share experiences and, and that kind of thing. So I think the more that you can cultivate within a society, within a community, this idea of mentorship and transgenerational, cross-generation uh, mentorship, I think that's really important. Congressman? Well, I'd just like to say, kind of on some, um, taking off uh, one of Eric's thoughts, but, and, and, and also the Marines, but uh, uh, I think it's important that the, that the country, that we try to exercise what influence we can with our own country to make our own country an example of good things and to make our own country and to reflect on the character and to make our own country an example of the way things should be for everybody. Uh, torture comes to mind. Yeah. Ryan, one more question? Please, right up here. Hi, I'm Garrett from Stanford University. I was wondering, um, one of the things we've seen in the past decade is that the U.S. Foreign Service and USA, the size of these organizations has declined dramatically. I was wondering if you think that the United States should renew its commitment to international development, particularly in light of financial crisis at home. Can I toss it to Laura? Sure. So I think <laughs> someone else should answer first. Yes. <laughs> but okay, I'll take it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll take an obvious stab, which is yes. Um, but that's why I was saying I'd be interested to hear what some of the other folks um, around here think. Um, you know, why, yes, why? Because I think you've already heard two people up here on this panel and, and, and other people that I've spoken to um, in the Department of Defense that have said, we can't do this job. Um, I, this is my own personal thought. I, and I've had arguments with friends of mine that are Marines. I don't think that, um, I think it confuses people sometimes when you have a Marine that people have seen shooting and, you know, uniform people have seen shooting that you also have there handing out things. I understand why the military does this, but um, I think if we can put a civilian side to uh, humanitarian assistance that, um, as, as we've said you know, on the panel before, that helps spread our good word, that helps show people that we really are, you know, are, 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 we have a human side to, um, to the United States and we just aren't representing guns and, and torture and other things. So, but I'd be interested to hear what other folks thought. Dr. Gray, and then now, Tim, I'll throw it to you then. Sure, I think that, uh, so, so the, answer, the answer is yes. We absolutely have to engage uh, much more effectively and much more forcefully abroad. What our generation is gonna be called upon to do though is to find new and creative ways to do that. So uh, you mentioned you know, a decline in foreign service officers and things. If you look back on the, on the Cold War, 
That's not going to be the model for effective international engagement overseas. When you think about what a Greg uh, Mortensen can do, when you think about what a targeted nonprofit organization can do, when you think about what a Peace Corps volunteer can do, when you think about uh, you know, the opportunities that exist in medical diplomacy for exchange among, among students, when you think about uh, you know, Admiral Kernan just took over Fourth Fleet and he's thinking about doing lots of new strategic partnerships in, in South America. There are so many interesting possibilities there. And in those possibilities, government may play a role, but they might not be the central role. What our generation is going to have to do is figure out ways to engage creatively and engage dynamically overseas. And I believe that if you do that, if you take people with the right set of passion, the right set of relationships, the right set of interests, you can engage incredibly effectively and often at, uh, at lower cost um, than, than, we, than we had in the past. And I think that's the challenge that our generation has to, has to meet. Thanks, Tim. And I just add to it saying, in a post 9-11 world, we don't have a choice. Uh, we are doing this and we must do it. Uh, it's hugely important to our national security and it's really important in terms of international development. This is fundamental. And if I sort of share from a military standpoint in this regard, we're, we're requiring officers and enlisted personnel in the military to be much more generalists maybe than we were before. If, if our focus sort of crudely as the military uh, was to, to kill people and break things, we're still asking for our military to have that capability, but we also have to help people and build things. And that requires a different skill set and requires being able to work with USAID or State Department or NGOs. And how do we as a country come together and bring sort of this full spectrum of engagement uh, when we talk about international development. How do we do that? And I think we're grappling with that right now. And boy, we're in need of a generation uh, of leaders who are passionate about that. And I think there's a number of people in this room. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that concludes the panel. But I, I think you'll agree, paradoxically, what we've learned is that cross-generational, transnational, transgenerational views of leadership are remarkably the same. It's about meaning, it's about others, it's about commitment, and it's about an unwillingness to stand for the status quo. Whether it's your dog that's poisoned in Texas, <laughs> whether it's the Red Army in Afghanistan, whether it's folks in Africa needing aid, whether it's folks that are supported by the State Department and USAID, or whether it's Marines in Al Anbar, leaders don't stand for the status quo. Thanks very much to the panelists.